Hi, I'm Brendan Albetsky, creator and writer and artist of Mario Kiro Destroy the Moon. Uh, you can find me on social, uh, Twitter and Instagram at Health to Breakfast or on my website, brendanalbetsky.com. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. He has the color scheme of a, a past guest uh, that we all know and love, Jules Rivera, but he is his own creator, his own talented person. So it's a beautiful comic. We're joined today by the ever talented Brendan Albetsky, creator of Maru Kiru Destroy the Moon. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kurt. Thanks a lot. And thank you for the very kind words. It, you know, it's kind of funny. I hear about everybody likes the colors. Everybody says it all the time. You're the first person to actually find an analogous artist who has a similar color scheme. So I'm, I'm really happy to start checking Jules out because I think it'll be nice to find a kindred spirit at last in the in the world of kind of neon acid drift color. <laughs> for those that don't know anything about Mero Kiru, Destroy the Moon. Tell us what it's all about. It's a fairly simple revenge story about a barbarian warrior named Maro Kiro who has decided to, to seek revenge upon uh, the moon for as yet unexplored reasons. Uh, you'll have to keep reading the comic if you, you want to find out what the backstory is there. She comes into to contest with, with a whole bunch of, of colorful villains and then bombastic characters, including uh, the high wizard priest Manototus, who speaks in large, booming baritone, which I hope comes across on the page, and other various uh, nefarious characters who try to hunt her down and stop her from not even really entirely sure what her plan is at this point. Right now, her plan, as stated in the comic, is to fly up to the moon on, on a skyship and then kill the moon god. And, and blow up the moon. And there's really not a whole lot of reason to think that anyone would be able to do that, but I think that's part of the appeal of her character is kind of uh, the obstinate nature that she approaches her quest. I, I think she's going to be able to do it. I hope that you do too. <laughs> it, it sounds like she'd be the perfect like main character in a D&D campaign or something like that, where like yeah. everyone just can't stop her and you can't talk sense into her. She's, she's going to do her goal and everything else be damned. Yeah, absolutely. It's that that really kind of strong physical presence of character, which is just an indomitable will and kind of cutting a blazing trail across this uh, this wasteland. It's a comic that's been really a lot of fun for me to work on. It's one of those things where, you know, you look at the cover, you look at the about the author page, mine is the only name on there because I'm the only person working on it. It's a passion project. And I, I kind of firmly believe that if you don't have fun working on your own comic, and if you can't stay really interested and passionate about the comic that you're working on, then you can't expect anybody else to want to read it. You have to be your own first fan, first and best fan. And if you aren't passionate about it, then you can't convince anybody else to be passionate about it. Either. It's funny you say that because there was someone, someone said this to me once a while back and I can't remember who it is. I apologize. If you're writing a script or if you're writing a comic or anything like that, and you're hooked by the first page or at least a scene in your comic in the first couple of pages that just makes you laugh or makes you chuckle or makes you interested in the character or the scene or whatever you were trying to, to create at that moment. As long as you have that passion to continue the script, the comic that way, you never run out of ideas. You never tire of it. You never let it sit for, for years on end. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually, I'm letting it sit at the moment just because I'm trying to get the, the book out. We're actually producing a, a physical copy of the book with a publisher called uh, Castain Publishing, which is going to be a lot of fun. And I finished the final PDF of that very recently. I'm itching to get back into drawing more of the story because like you said, it's difficult to leave it alone. I've never reached a point on this project where I've been bored. And if I ever start feeling that, I kind of just jump to whatever the next good part is. <laughs> it's just it's a just the good parts kind of comic. <laughs> no fluff, basically. Yeah. You know, succinct storytelling is something that is not done very often these days, or if it is, it, it misses beats. It just doesn't have the same flow as maybe what's going on in your head. Yeah, it can be difficult because comics are a really slow moving medium and you get people who really think about comics as though they are transcribed films, like a flattened film, if you will. If you try to do that, you know, you, you end up with just endless pages, dialogue and scene setting and, you know, which is great. And a lot of people can, can work like that. And if you're somebody like Alan Moore, who would write a script that, you know, would require Dave Gibbons, I'm talking, talking about Watchmen, uh, <laughs> require Dave Gibbons to, you know, just 
ridiculously dive into every aspect of the scene. But I mean, that's even a bad example because I think Alan Moore said in an interview that that's why comics don't translate well to film is because you can't sit and stare at a frame for hours on end and pick out every detail. I try to be a comic creator first and foremost. People ask me like, what's your goal for your comic? And it's like, I want it to sit on a bookshelf somewhere. I don't really have any aspirations to animation or anything like that because I think that it's, you know, I wrote it as a comic. It's supposed to be a comic. And and that's kind of what I'm passionate about. You know, looking then at, at this comic itself and, and the fact that you're not bored, so this should be a pretty easy answer to come by here. Sure. What was the first seed of the story or maybe an image that popped into your mind that mm -hmm. eventually developed into this comic? And what did the development look like moving forward from that initial spark? So it's, it's kind of a couple of things. And I was reading Hirohiko Araki's book about making manga at the time. One of the things that he said about, you know, your, your, your comic should be focused around a character. In the first kind of thing that you need to do is establish who is your character and what are they trying to do? And it's why so many shonen manga start off with like a big splash page of here's the character and here's them just kind of telling you what they're about. Uh, and that's actually the second page of the first issue of, of Mario Kira, Destroy the Moon, as you might recall, is... is mm -hmm who she is and she's gonna blow up the moon. But the first kind of like real key art piece that I started working around was actually, you actually have it up in the banner on the bottom there. It's when she's swinging the sword at Manotatus. That was the first page that I drew that ended up in the comic, that big spread of them about to collide in the center. And that is like the spirit of action that I wanted to bring to as many of the pages as I possibly could. It's just kind of that moment right before the impact or right after the impact really carry that energy in a lot of places. That's why everybody's always yelling at each other and <laughs> jumping across panels and, and, you know, taking big swings and smashing stuff. Uh, just, I want to infuse that energy into every little bit of it. We did as much as we could. Look, you hit it out of the park. Trust me. I love the fact that there's very little standing around talk. I love the fact that you have motion, you have action, you have a flow of your panels. It's not just static, static, static. You, you have a great overall concept of what you're trying to convey in, in your scenes. And, and I think motion, especially in comics, are more necessary than ever when it comes to conveying the story and, and your character development as well. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I've worked on a couple of different things with, with a couple of different writers, but when I'm doing it by myself, I think the the greatest advantage I have is that I don't have to work from a script. I don't actually ever really write scripts out ahead of time. I usually will have an outline of story beats, but I work out most of the dialogue and action and, and layouts on the page as I'm drawing it, which means it takes a lot longer in thumbnailing than it might if I was working off of a script. But like my my first step is to go straight to the thumbnails and the art. And that makes it a lot easier for me to kind of flow through everything because I can take something and say, okay, well, this isn't working out here. I'm going to blow this out into two pages instead of just one. Or, you know, this part maybe that I had envisioned initially as two pages is not quite enough. So that, that very rarely happens. I very rarely compress. I usually am expanding out. But I think that there's a lot of writers who write for comics, who they're good at writing dialogue, dialogue. I know a lot of great dialogue writers, but it's tough for um, a writer who doesn't draw to kind of envision how art flows in, in, in some cases. And if, if you're a writer trying to get into comics, even if you're very bad at drawing, I would definitely advise you to try to scribble some of it out yourself because I think it's a great exercise and you, you learn a lot about how the page moves uh, and the best way to write for it. That's how I got started in doing art and I ended up wanting to draw all my own stuff. So, <laughs> Well, let, let's look back a little earlier in your career because uh, it's great that you're doing this here, but when you first started, what was your first gig as a, as a comic writer or artist? Uh, my very first gig as a comic writer and artist was for my college newspaper, the Connecticut Daily Campus at UConn. They had a bunch of comic strips on the head of comics page. Worked with a friend to, you know, submit a comic. Um, we got paid $5 a strip that we had to, to split. And at the end of the, our first year doing that, the editor position opened up and I applied for it. And I had no, any kind of newspaper experience or any kind of journalism experience or anything. And I just said, hey, what the hell? I'll go for it. And nobody else applied for the job. Uh, <laughs> so I got it. And then as the editor, I got to choose what comics went on the page. I said, well, you know, a perfect opportunity to start drawing my own comic. Then I'll be making seven fifty a week mm -hmm. instead of the initial two fifty. I actually have a lot of people who I read on that comics page that I'm still really big fans of. Steve Winchell and Sean Rose. Sean, who doesn't draw comics as much as he used to, does now his most famous thing is... Uh, 
is a parody of early 2000s gamer comics called The Red Ring of Death. And it's absolutely abhorrent. It's, it's the worst thing you'll ever read. And it's hilarious. It's, I think it's as close to a perfect parody as you could possibly get. Steve, who works with a writer named Ben Vigiant on a comic called Phil, which is like this bizarre avant-garde talking heads comic and these were things that like were in the paper when i was in college and i still read them and i was lucky enough to actually you know have a personal relationship with some of these creators and people ask me like you know what got you started out in comics when did you first fall in love with comics i was well it'd be phil comics by by steve and ben and they're like what the hell are you talking about <laughs> just, well, I, don't, I don't know also batman i guess <laughs> I mean, some people go Garfield. Oh, yeah, yeah. This feels like it has Conan-esque vibes as well, yep. too. If that isn't an influence, I don't know what is. It definitely is. I'm not going to try to pretend that it's not. One of my favorite movies of all time. I love the early um, Savage Tales comics with Conan and... Uh, even some of the some of the Jason Aaron run. I'm not the biggest fan of all of it, but it, 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 some of it's good. And you know, I think it's a character. Conan's a, a bit of a problematic character, but he's legendary enough that you can get around a lot of some of the the dicier aspects of of his his origin and and some of his original stories. <laughs> and that's that's one of the things I wanted to do with Maru Kiro is like I really want to create this cool sword and sorcery comic with all the hyper violence and stuff. Maybe we can leave behind uh, some of the dicier trappings of the genre. <laughs> you talked about writing and, and drawing for comics. Do you think someone can be a creative person if they don't feel emotions either as a comic writer or an artist? Yeah, there's a clinical aspect to, to writing that I think you can accomplish without an emotional connection. I think you see that in kind of maybe some harder sci-fi where I, I definitely know people who have been writers who have, have kind of really approached it from almost a kind of a robotic standpoint, of like as many details as possible and how it works, kind of like the Moby Dick history of whaling kind of aspect to it. And I don't want to say that an emotional connection is necessary. I think, you know, for me, that's definitely a huge part of it. I think there's a, there's, there's a space in, in creativity for everybody. So if you're, if you're not an emotional person and you want to write kind of more of a clinically descriptive, hard sci-fi piece, there's definitely an audience for that. Beneficial, but not essential. I know I couldn't do without it, but I'm not the only person in the world. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a question I've always thought interesting because um, there are many different types. People sometimes are more introverted when it comes to the creative process and they internalize quicker than they mm -hmm. externalize it when it comes to the, the writing process or the creative process. So it may feel robotic to some, but it could be... A creative outlet for others it yeah depends oh yeah on how they're read or viewed there's there's a world of all different people with all kinds of different ways of experiencing art and you know art is writing art whatever you want to call it is a way to, to reach out and connect with others so you know you're not alone in the world and there's going to be somebody out there who who thinks the same way that you do or can appreciate the way that you think just the act of of expressing yourself however you want to do it on the page and putting that out there for somebody to, to interact with is, you know, it's a big deal. And there's no one right way to do it, I think. <laughs> Here, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Language had power. I feel like that's almost like a, you know, the first time you tell a lie and somebody believes you. <laughs> when, you're, when you're a kid, is a, it would be like an example of like, well, look at that. You know, you kind of create something from whole cloth and get away with it. I can't think of a specific example of that, but I feel like young Brendan might have, have, have thought along those lines. <laughs> the real thing that sticks out to me, I don't know if this is a first example, but it's definitely the most prominent example, is in uh, Mike Bignola's Hellboy in The Wolves of St. August, which is my favorite Hellboy story. There is uh, a page where Kate is interacting with one of the werewolf ghosts and it's with a young girl and she says, uh, you know, I know that God doesn't love me because he made me this. And that's when she turns into the wolf. And that still gives me chills, even just saying it now. It's like one of the most powerful pages in the history of comics. I've drawn it, my, I've redrawn it myself several times and never showed anybody because it's not, that's just a personal thing. But that's like my favorite page ever in comics that resonates with me even now. And, and I think it's just awesome. So that's like, that'd be my example of like, yeah. You know, language has power, art has power. Here it is, hitting you right in the face with it. So then as a creative person, what's the most misunderstood aspect when you tell someone that isn't in the industry that you're a creative person? Uh, uh, the concept of, of talent <laughs> as a whole. I've got arguments with people who say like, oh, you're, you're so talented. I said, no, I'm really not. I started off drawing, you know, 
crappy stick figures. Uh, and I spent 10 years locked in a closet um, working on this stuff for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And I practiced and I practiced and I practiced and, and none of it felt like it came naturally ever. It was always work. You know, it was work that I loved doing, but it was always work. And so that's that's the kind of thing that still kind of gets my goat when somebody be like, oh, I wish I had talent like you. It's, it's, it's not what it's about. You can do exactly what I do. It just takes time and practice. That's the big misconception that I always try to fight against. It's like, yeah, I guess there are people who are more naturally inclined to, to work on this stuff than others, but it should not be exclusionary. There's nobody who is not capable of this with enough time and enough um, practice. What was the hardest scene for you to write in this comic? Probably be the transition from chapter three to chapter four. Maru and Yaga are looking down over Tanaris at the end of chapter three. And they say, how am I going to get, because I knew I wanted to get her into the, um, spoilers, uh, <laughs> I knew I wanted to get her into the arena uh, in chapter four. And I'm like, how, what series of events that's going to happen? And I figured it all out and I blocked it all out. And I'm like, this is going to take forever. And I said, just screw it. And I just <laughs> cut it all out. And I said, you know what? You know what? The fastest way to get her there is just put her there. So that's how chapter four starts. If you just skip that big, boring chunk. Um, and I think that's always the hardest thing for me is I, I think very linearly um, when I'm talking, when I think about narrative and it results in kind of a lot of early drafts that are really bogged down in details and then going through the second draft and just taking big swaths of stuff out can be difficult because I'm like, what if people don't understand this? And I'm like, you know what? David Lynch is an artist who has fans and he never explains what the hell's going on. So I, I can do it too. <laughs> that's something where you either like David Lynch or you, or you just don't understand him like that I, yeah. I i took film theory classes and he was one of the subjects that came up and it was just like the the room was split and yep. it was just like even the even the professor was like i like most of his stuff i just don't like this this and this and it's just like yeah yeah he's he, I, I i have mixed feelings about him too honestly i just think he's a good example for somebody who's gotten really successful being really non-conventional um but when i when i watched twin peaks the return i i didn't like it as much as my friends did and they they were trying to gauge why i oh, i wasn't enjoying it as much as them and i described it as old men struggling the series uh because it's <laughs> It's just all these old guys just kind of struggling to do stuff for like 19 episodes. And then an atomic bomb goes off for 50 minutes. <laughs> what themes spoke to you when you first started creating this? And what themes did you see when you finally finished the first book? We're really early in Maru's mm -hmm. story. So she's kind of, she hasn't done a whole lot in, in, in terms of, of character growth um, and what we might want to see from her in, in the long run of the comic. And, you know, she's kind of still figuring out, you know, what she's about, because right now we're very focused on, on the revenge aspect, even if it's nebulous, what, what caused that in the first place. I really think of it from almost from, from a manga perspective of effort and friendship is, you know, that's what every shonen manga is about is effort and friendship. And One Piece is a great example. Luffy's a character who I, I, I look up to a lot in terms of, you know, how this character operates. And he's not particularly complex, but he's grounded by, you know, really firm principles that he never wavers from. And I, I see the kind of the same thing in, in, in Maro is that she's angry about everything, but she's incredibly determined to, to, to carve her path and doesn't mess around and, and doesn't kind of, you know, stray from that. She's very one-track minded and, and, and directionally focused. So, you know, what's going to happen to her in seeing her challenges, you know, when she comes up against stuff that she's not ready for, which happens in the first couple of issues, you know, <laughs> she's, she's overconfident from, from, from jump, but you know, how is she going to learn to operate? How is she going to start interacting with the people who are either trying to help her or trying to hinder her? What's going to happen the first time somebody tries to trick her into doing something? What happens when the world becomes more complex than the, than the character's understanding of it? Because you have a character who's really simple and is really directionally focused and it says, okay, here's point A, here's point B, and I'm going to go in a straight line. But the world is not going to cooperate with that. So how is she going to, to navigate um, the many paths that will be laid before her? <laughs> the nameology aspect of characters I always find fascinating, truly, because it takes a layer of the creative process of the person that that's creating the comic itself, whether it's the artist or writer or, or collaborative effort, whatever that may be. How did you come up with the names of these 
characters because they are unique and they, they fit the world that you've built. Manototus is a name that I've had scribbled in the back of a notebook for years. And I don't even remember where it came from. It's just something that's been like on is like name somebody this at some point. And I thought it was a really good, complicated name for <laughs> For a character who essentially just tears his shirt off and screams at people and then you know blasts them with magic, <laughs> so I like I, I it was always a villain name. I says I want to I want to name a villain this, and I'm like this is going to be. I went through a couple of different comics where I was um you know kind of trying some stuff out, and when I started working on this, I'm like this you know this is the one. It's time to time to wheel that name out and use that. He was the first character who actually designed for for this piece. Uh, and then Marukiro um, kind of went on a, a journey of, she had a couple of different names that I won't bother to divulge because they're not that good. It stuck to me as something that was nice and, you know, two two-syllable names, I think kind of just really nicely rolls off the tongue. I messed around in, in with the Google Translate, just kind of uh, finding translations in, in a myriad of different languages for for different words. And I, I, I both, both names mean murderer. <laughs> I don't even... <laughs> I don't even know which or, or killer. I don't remember what I was what I was searching exactly, and I don't remember what languages they come from. I knew I wanted two two syllable names, and I wanted them to both kind of be focused on kind of the violent drive. So just kind of messed around until I found ones that that rolled off the tongue in a way that I liked, and and that's where I kept it. What's your creative kryptonite then? I'm trying to think of the other names that I've used in this. And it, <laughs> naming characters actually is really difficult for me. It's why I, I, I cheat a lot in terms of like using name generators and, and changing syllables and, and, and shifting things around. I think it's tough to come up with, with um, good organic sounding names and dialogue is another thing that I, that I struggle with. I, reading your dialogue out loud <clears throat> is something that's really helpful. And I also think that keeping it as really simple and, and defluffed as possible is another thing that it will help you improve your dialogue on the page. Um, really, the the last thing you want to do is is start devolving into Whedonese or or, or Tarantino speak. Whatever you feel about the, them, particularly, uh, you know, I feel like Tarantino is a really great dialogue writer, but I feel like he did a horrible, horrible thing in that he's created an entire generation of writers who think they can be just like him. Mm, not really. <laughs> So yeah, I just I try to keep it simple whenever I can because I, I do overthink and I do overcomplicate in a lot of cases and I think it ends up with stuff that sounds wooden and, and not true. A lot of characters, if I don't have a good enough name for them, I just won't name them until I have to. It's like, all right, we'll give you a name later. And sometimes one kind of forms as the as the piece goes on and I'll go back and I'll, and I'll change it and you know keep it like that. It's funny that since I started out writing and picked up art as kind of a way to facilitate that, that it's really flipped around where now it's like the art feels much more natural to me and the writing is the part that's just like ugh, i dread it sometimes <laughs> so what was the first uh, manga that made you cry i think the most recent one would be berserk because uh hmm. after kento miura died i started i started reading berserk but um that was very recent in terms of what the first one was might have been one piece that seems like a like a good get but i know i read mangas before that and i'm just trying to think back the first one that made me um, provoked a real gut reaction was was Uzumaki mm -hmm. uh, by Junji Ito, which is still one of my favorite um, pieces of all time. But Akira also was 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 a very big emotional thing. So it, it's tough to kind of pin it down. I don't know. Everything kind of blends together, <laughs> and and I'm the kind of person who cries at a lot of media. So it's like it's not like it was a really watershed moment because um, it's like you know I'll tear up at the end of most kids' movies, but. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, you know, if I, if I had to pick like a really notable example, it's, I mean, yeah, one piece at the end of like Alabasta or whatever is, is that's, that's a huge, anytime somebody's standing on a beach and giving a tearful goodbye, it's like, yeah, all right. You know, <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm curious about the publisher. Um, I, I'm not familiar with, with many publishers, so I apologize. What's the publisher name again? It's called Castane. They're really small um, and, and very new, but I've done some work for hire stuff for them before with illustration. They came to me and said, you know, if you ever want to publish Mario anywhere, you know, we'd love to do it. And I says, yeah, sure. <laughs> At the time, I was I was toying with the idea of, of doing Kickstarter. I know a lot of people have had a lot of success on Kickstarter. But I just felt it was a a better way for me to go at this time was to work with a publisher directly uh, instead of trying to you know hopefully to lean on somebody who had a little bit more experience doing actual physical publishing because most of what I've done has been digital. Kind of leaning on their experience and you know they they know people like book binders and printers and all kinds of cool stuff that I would have to figure out for myself if I was going to do a Kickstarter. So I thought that's the way we're going to do it. They offered me a deal that was uh, 
what I wanted, which is, you know, retain my IP rights is kind of my, my, my biggest thing. I don't want to give them up to anybody, especially after things like Action Lab and all the people that they effed over. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of people, I know some people personally who have, who have managed to reclaim their, their IP rights, but I mean, it's, I think there are still some out there that are, that are lingering. Um, and it's a real, it's a real unfortunate situation. It's the kind of thing it's like, I'm not going to mince words about it. It's, 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 it's pretty bullshit. Um, and you know, the people who created the IPs, uh, deserve to retain ownership of them. Um, and I'm always going to be on the side of the creators in these, I, even, even, even if I had friends who are publishers and I have a couple of friends who are publishers, I guess, um, you're, you're never going to see me side with the publisher on that. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's good that you found a publisher that, that works with you. And, and you get all of your rights. So at what point are we good enough? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> what was that? It was just, I forget who said it to whom. It was about two authors, and one of them was Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch-22. Oh, and some yes, other author was the other. And they said, how do you feel that this guy makes more in a day than Catch-22 will ever make in its entire publication history? And Joe Heller said something along the lines of, I have something that he's never going to have. The knowledge that I have enough. I feel very similarly. When do we have enough? I, when, when you're happy with it, I guess I'm going to be able to put my comic on my own bookshelf very soon. And that's a huge deal for me. At that point, I'm going to be pretty happy. Will I have enough at that point? Uh, no, because I have a lot more comics to write. Um, <laughs> but I guess when I've, when I've told my story and managed to print all of it and I've got it all collected in one place, that's when I'll have enough. Everybody in comics, everybody in indie comics who I know has a day job. I have a day job. There's nothing to be ashamed about. It's just the way the industry is right now. It's like, it's not enough to, to, to live off your books at the moment. Even really famous people, like um, there was, this is years ago, but somebody asked Tom King, like, you know, how do you, how do you manage to make a, a living as a comic, um, you know, as a comic writer or a comic artist? And Tom King said something to the effect of, I get to be on my wife's insurance and that's why I get to write stories about Batman. So even like the super pros are, are struggling in some places. So it's like, it, it's, it, it is what it is. And we just kind of have to make do um, in a perfect world uh, enough for me would be like, oh, you know, I'm full-time employed as a, as a comic artist, but I feel like that's such a pipe dream for everybody nowadays. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that I get to tell my story and that I get to, to read it myself at the end of the day and share it with somebody would be nice too, but that's gravy at that point. Uh, Dirk Manning's been on the show before. He's written a bunch of Nightmare World and a bunch of great horror comics and all that stuff. He's part of Source Point Press. His goal in his creative lifetime as a, as a comic writer was to have a spinner rack full of his comics. And That's a great goal. <laughs> and every time I, I interview him, it's it's sitting right behind him, literally. And he's like, "That rack's almost full. I guess I got to get another one." I just I recently uh, this is this is my cover. This is the first printed cover I've ever had. This was on the Metroid Thirty Five fanzine that came out recently. They're actually doing another print run. But this was the first time that I got to like. Look, it's me on the cover. <laughs> so that was a pretty cool thing. And I had this out on a coffee table for for, for weeks. So I'm like, we're going to tell everybody about this. <laughs> That's great. I mean, you're seeing your work in print. You're seeing your work out in the, out by the masses are seeing, you know, as a creative person, that's all, that's all we really care about is mm. who notices us? Who can we showcase our work to that appreciates our work? Maybe they don't know us as on a personal level, but they can appreciate our art, our writing, our, our creative talent. Shouts to the, the Metroid fan community who has always been super supportive of me for, for whatever reason. I don't know. I draw, I draw Metroid fan art and I draw my own comics. And that's, <laughs> they, they, there's some parallel there. I guess it's a uh, strong women at the, at, at the four is kind of the, the, the parallel. A lot of people who have become fans of my comics started because they're like, Oh, that's the guy who draws Samus. And <laughs> yeah, uh, that's me. The other one, the other thing is like, um, I've been in a couple of these uh, trading card collections, and there's this 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 fine um, philanthropic individual named uh, Scott Majrinsky, and he's done several of these charity trading card collections now. And there's another one that's coming out uh, later this year. Um, the first two were X Men related, two card faces in the first one and four in the second one because the second one they had uh, they were double sided cards. Later this year, there's a, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles one's coming out, and I have five, and you know they're really great charity events that 
Scott's done it's have been great publicity for a lot of people. Artists that are way, way better than me on, on, on all these project projects. So it's like, they're really worth checking out. Um, and even if you can't uh, afford to buy like the full car set, card set, you can get a PDF of it. I think that you can see the art and you know, interact with it, which is, which is great. But that's been a big deal for me. And, and Scott's always been really supportive of me and, and, and my art. Uh, and he's one of the kind of early people to, to come to me as an artist and be like, wow, you know, I love the way you do this. And I love the way you do that. Uh, if you ever want to support an artist, especially somebody who's just getting started, find something that they've made and tell them specific things that you like about it, because that's really inspiring. If you just be like, yeah, that's cool. You did a good, I'm like, that's nice too. That's nothing ever going to hurt. But like, you really want to inspire somebody to be like, I love the way you did. I love the way you colored that face. Or, you know, I love the the way you used, um, you know, lighting on, on this specific thing. And it's like, that's, that will tell them, you know, what they are good at and what they can keep developing and keeps people going. I haven't, I've been lucky enough that I haven't felt like giving up at all really in the past couple of years. And I know that, you know, COVID has, has been a struggle for a lot of people and kind of being isolated has been a struggle for a lot of people. So it's like, you want to support your artists uh, and you don't necessarily have the money to do it. Um, just telling them that you love them and that you love their work uh, and the specific things you like about it too is also, is always nice to hear, but that's really helpful to a lot of people. Uh, and, and I don't think the importance of that can be cast aside. It's not always about money. Sometimes it's about money. I said recently that the, the trick to making in, in indie comics is to charge $5 more for your book than the book of the friend who you just bought. <laughs> It's the only way you're going to make any money. <laughs> to be honest, that that's just good business sense. Social media, retweet, a, a like, a share, you know, mm. the, the small things really do. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, doesn't matter what type of creative person you are. It, it just lets you keep going. Art is you reaching out and trying to, to connect with somebody. And if you don't, get that connection back, it can be, it can be painful. Yeah. And I see a lot of people that, that feel like they're being ignored and it's not entirely your fault as a viewer because the algorithm is a little bit fucky and, and doesn't like artists for whatever reason. If you see somebody putting themselves out there, eh, don't ignore it. Hit the little heart button. It takes a fraction of a second or say nice work, you know? <laughs> and if you don't like it, don't, you don't have to interact with it, but it's, it's really easy to, to let somebody know that you care even a little bit. And that helps a lot sometimes. What is the second wisest thing someone has ever said to you that has stuck with you in your varying careers? I think that uh, it's, it's, it's something that's been said. The principle that I kind of just keep living by, and I feel like I've been told it a couple of times by a couple of different people, but it's that you are your, you are your own first fan. That is, I don't remember who said that to me, honestly. Um, but because I think it's generic enough that anybody, it could have been anybody. You know, you as a creator are are your own first fan. So you need to write something that you would want to read. Uh, and that's how we get cool, unique pieces of art that last for years and years. There's a clinical way, there's a professional way to, to create art, movies, music, blah, 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 whatever. And that's what people call like corporate art. You know, you can do it as a job. You absolutely can. You can write something that you don't care about, but it's not going to be poignant you need to write for yourself and you need to create for yourself and then connect with people who think like you do or who appreciate some of the same things that you do. And maybe you get your horizons expanded a little bit when they, when they interact with it and, and, and fire back at it. You know, writing for yourself first is kind of the best way to keep yourself going because if you are entertained by what you are producing, then you will keep making it. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? It's a handful of people. I can't pick, I can't really narrow it down to just one, but in terms of, and they're both personal friends, which is great. My friends, Robin and Zach, were both really instrumental in encouraging me to, to continue drawing. I, I, I've said it a couple of times and I say it in every podcast interview. When I started doing this, I was really, I was really terrible. And I feel like any normal person would have been like, yeah, you, you, this isn't for you. You shouldn't keep doing this. But both of them were really supportive at a time when they didn't really necessarily need to be. And maybe I wasn't the best student. I'm not even sure they, they understand how kind of how much impact they had on, on keeping me going in that. So the, the two of them were really, really influential in getting me where I am now. From a professional perspective, you have created art. You've written your own comic. You've drawn your own comic. You have part of the trading card scene, you heard a bunch of amazing projects in the, in your lifetime. And I'm sure I have to have you back on to talk about more about what you've done in your career here, other than Marukiru. 
from a professional standpoint, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I think I would argue against me being successful from a professional standpoint. <laughs> I feel like you need to make a significant amount of money on your professional works in order to be considered a kind of professionally successful. I would say that I'm much more personally successful than I am professionally successful because everything that I make, I really love and, and stand behind and am enthusiastic about. And I think that that's a great personal triumph. Professionally, uh, I think that's kind of more of a, of a monetary thing. I'm not quite there yet. So uh, I think I'd actually flip that one and say that, no, I think that everything that you mentioned kind of speaks to my personal success. And uh, someday maybe professional success will follow. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, I bury them in the backyard. Um, I, I have made many, many comics over the last 10 years. I think they're pretty much impossible to find anywhere, and that's intentional. Um, so <laughs> I squirrel them away, uh, and I do look back on them occasionally because I do keep everything in records and I'll throw anything out. I try to stay focused on you know what I think is the best thing. And the stuff that I'm doing right now is the best stuff I've ever done. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. But the failures are there to kind of keep us informed and, and teach the lessons. So they're important. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a, a writer, an artist, or something in between. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Do better than we did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it won't be hard. So, you know, we kind of, we layer and we build on on whoever came before us creatively. And what was somebody said, um, George Lucas made Star Wars because because he was inspired by Westerns and samurai movies. And then you've got a generation of people who just want to make more Star Wars. Uh, don't be that, you know, don't try to, don't try to copy the people who came before you enjoy and love all the stuff that they made. Absolutely. You know, figure out what your story is and what makes what you want to do unique and follow that. And that's how we're going to keep building and, and making better stuff. Uh, if your life was a movie, what would its title be? And what soundtrack would you have? Interesting. If my life was, I feel like my life would make for uh, not the most exciting movie in the world. It's a, it's a lot of a guy sitting at a desk and drawing pictures. Sounds like David Finch. Yeah. <laughs> what would the title of uh, title of my movie be? Boy, coming up with titles is tough. When I came up with Destroy the Moon, I was like, yeah, that's great. I'm going to use that forever. Never going to start another project, so I don't want to come up with any more titles. I, I can't even think of like what the soundtrack would be because you know I, it's the guy. I I think I'd want to make it ridiculous, and that that'd be the only way. Yeah, I, I would I would want to make it just absolutely um, insane and over the top, and it would be called like like explosive drawing or something like that, and just ridiculous. And I need it would need to be scored uh, by by Daisuke Ishiwatari from Guilty Gear fame. <laughs> Just like, just preposterous butt rock soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You've survived, Brendan. I do greatly appreciate you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, there was a lot more hot seat questions than I think I was anticipating, but that's fine. I think we got through it. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And where can we find all of your massive amounts of work that, you know, we should be supporting in the future? Yeah, thanks. Um, so brendanalbetsky.com, which is at the bottom of the screen there, you can see it, um, is where kind of my hub for for everything. So you can get links to buy the comics there and you can check out my portfolio and, and you know even commission stuff if you're into that sort of thing. I do take commissions, but I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. My handle's at Hell to Breakfast. Uh, that was the name of my comic in the paper at UConn and I just never lost the handle. So that's the story behind that. You don't even need to ask me now. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if you just want to throw a donation my comics are being sold on my coffee page it's brendan albetsky on coffee uh so if you feel like throwing some money my way or buying some comics uh, that's the place to do that and uh keep an eye on casting and publishing because that's where you'll be able to get the maru kiro destroy the moon volume one book when that comes out uh spring 2022 late spring spring goes until june <laughs> That ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated than our website because I'm only one person, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.